They're not actually saying what God um, would have for them to know or to put into their life. They're putting the things into their life that are uh, pleasing to them. And the title of the sermon this morning is Compassion Practiced and Preached Here. And this is very much a, uh, a title that we can apply to our church, our congregation, and it's something that we actually put into practice every single time we go out soul winning. And I can't help but notice, yesterday even as we were uh, going soul winning, where I got this title from was actually on a marquee on a, on a church right up the road from here. A liberal church up there that's, um, I don't know, all the, all, all the goings on of it. But I can tell you one thing for sure, they are not going out and preaching the gospel. They are not going out and telling people what it takes to be saved. Their congregation, I'm sure, has many persons in there that are not saved and on their way to hell. And so for a, for a church or for a, a somebody in, uh, a, a, that would call themselves a Christian in Christ's name to not preach the gospel, I think uh, God just abhors that. I think God finds that very offensive. And he's very angry about that. And so I don't mean to just joke about a local marquee um, that's up the street, but honestly, we apply this quote to us. And it's and it, uh, this quote, it's not a quote. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a saying there. But compassion preached and preached here. Uh, preached and practiced here is what we do. We, we don't only preach it, but we practice uh, what we preach, which is having compassion on people. Uh, really caring for people, really wondering uh, where they're going to go and having a broken heart for those that are not saved. This is, in fact, a petition in response to those who would call what we do, our confrontational soul winning, would call it spiritual mugging. Have you ever heard people refer to it as that? Has anybody in here ever heard somebody refer to what we do as spiritual mugging? It's when you go and you knock on somebody's door and you, you confront them and you bully them and you just uh, berate them with the word of God, apparently. Uh, that not, is not at all what we do. But you've seen um, often enough, I'm sure, how easy it is to go and just casually invite somebody to church or maybe to talk to them about the light spiritual things. But as soon as you start turning the screws on them about the Bible, as soon as you start asking them about their relationship with Jesus Christ, as soon as you start getting specific about heaven and hell and eternity and everlasting life, that's when they really bristle. That's when they really have a problem with it. And um, this is where even uh, my wife has experienced it. I've experienced it. And uh, maybe some of you have as well where somebody will actually tell us at the door, they would say, and they, they're, both times that I can recall, it was a saved person telling us this, or somebody that, that um, would call themselves a Christian, uh, that would say, you know, really, the, the way that you're knocking on doors and asking people that question, it, it's really abrasive, you know? You really need to lighten up in that. Have any of you ever had somebody at, at the door say that to you? Yeah, I see some, some heads nodding, yeah. So, you, you know, it's funny, like, you know, we've been doing this for years, and all of a sudden now somebody at their door is going to, like, tell us a better way, you know? But, but, but here's what's going on here. There's an account here of false prophets preaching damnable heresies. And if you look in uh, 23, 16, and 17, just quickly, I know he just read this, and so I'm not going to reread the whole, the whole passage here by any means, but I do want to pick it apart. Um, but at the same time, we're not going through this chapter verse by verse. Um, in 16 and 17, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say, Still, turn them that despise me. The Lord has said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. That is not at all the message that Jesus would have for those who are not walking with him, those who are not saved. Jesus, God, would never expect us to go out and to tell somebody who is lost, who is on their way to hell, that everything is fine, that everything is peachy, that they're going to have a good life. That's what I think is so hard for me to, um, to comprehend about these prosperity preachers on television, and even locally there are some, but not only are they preaching a prosperity message, which I think is just so carnal and sinful in itself, but they're overlooking, they're, they're totally not preaching salvation. They're not talking about everlasting life, eternal life. That is the most valuable thing that, that anyone can preach. That is the number one thing that we need to be preaching, is that. So I'm not going to take time today to rip on every each and every false prophet or false teaching out there. And just to kind of reread just a few verses here, we get the idea that God already said that he's against them. Those that are out there today, God is already against them. And so I don't need any judgment brought on them for my glory or for 
you know, to, to justify what I'm saying or for me. God is the one that matters. It's God's word that matters. They're already against God. And just in Jeremiah 23, reading 25 through 32, we see this. He says, I have heard what the prophet said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they're prophets of the deceit of their own heart which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. We see what's going on here. God is very angry at this. So the point that I'm preaching today that I want to emphasize a little bit here in this, is that there is still a forthcoming judgment. It is not all roses and sunshine. It is not everybody's going to be fine. You go your way, I'll go mine. You know, maybe God will pour out a blessing on you while you're living in some sinful condition, some, in some rotten state out here, you know, eternally headed for hell. But hey, you know, we're not going to talk about that. You know, we're going to talk about how God wants to bless you and won't let anything bad happen to you. So there is still a future uh, judgment coming, a forthcoming judgment. The book of Jeremiah is applicable to every Christian today as we're all commanded to preach the gospel and we're all commanded to bear much fruit, are we not? And how many times in the Bible do we say here, see you're bearing much fruit? I mean, that is directly talking about um, multiplication, whether it's in a physical, fleshly sense, having children, multiplying, or even in a spiritual sense, it is still winning souls to Christ. It is still multiplying our members. It is growing the body. It is uh, growing the kingdom. It is multiplying. And that is a commission that each and every saved person is sent to do. We, we shall all be preachers. So as I read this, I'm not trying to, you know, stretch and apply, you know, a, a particular passage or a, or a certain thing to just everybody. But understanding God and knowing who he is and the commission that we have, the task that God has uh, uh, laid before us, uh, it's very applicable that we know how to preach and what to preach. And we're not going to take any advice from anybody out there that's going to tell us a better way to do it than the way that we practice. Not because it's something that we have imagined or we have created or we have invented, but it's what the Bible says. And you know what? Honestly, I've seen fruit from the way that we go soul winning. Amen. I mean, you can't tell me that we, you know, we're, that we're going out here in vain when week after week after week we're seeing souls saved. So, you know, these these people that are going to tell us that there's a better way to do it, I venture to say they probably never led somebody to the Lord. And if so, it's so few and far between. You know, typical lifestyle evangelism stuff right there, where you know you lead, you know, one person every ten years or something ridiculous like that. We're not going to listen to them. So, here's what we're talking about, though: a compassionate preacher. What's a compassionate preacher look like? Well, you know as well as I do what we're getting into is a compassionate preacher tells the truth. A compassionate preacher shoots them straight. You know, I'm, I'm not going to mislead my children just to, uh, you know, protect their feelings or, um, you know, save them from, from some hard speech that I know is going to set them up for failure later. Just the same. As a, as a compassionate preacher, as a compassionate soul winner, we go out being able to tell people what lies ahead. And now, and I'm not saying here at this point or, or anywhere in this sermon that we go out preaching hellfire damnation and that's it, right? We obviously go out with the love of Jesus Christ, the uh, free gift of salvation that, that God, Jesus Christ, offers. Uh, we go out with those. But there are so many today that totally overlook anything hard and it's all lightness. And it's lightness in their outreach and it's lightness in their pulpits, and it's lightness in their music, and it's just lightness all the way through. And that's not at all being compassionate. Uh, that is tickling men's ears and uh, actually pleasing themselves. So as we know, a compassionate preacher warns of danger, and in verse 32 we see that God is displeased 
with lightness. And these Christians today not only preach light, but they actually criticize hard truth. And if you get out there online and you do some reading, you watch some videos, um, you can see in the comments where people respond back to you know, the sermons or the songs or the uh, uh, Once Saved, Always Saved videos or the gospel presentation videos, and people will comment on there. And they really uh, have a problem with confrontational soul winning. They will call out uh, those that are preaching hard against sin, they'll call out those that are preaching hard what the Bible says and say, man, you really need more grace. You really need more love. I mean, I know pastors that are rebuking soul winners and telling them, you need to be more gracious. So my goodness, a biblical soul winner preaching, you know, what people need to hear to get saved and to say, you need to chill out, you need to be more gracious. Mm. If the preacher was true, we find here also that people would be getting saved. Uh, in in uh, 23, 22, what does it say right here? In 22, he says, But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the way of their doings. These preachers need to be preaching the truth of God that people can get saved. I'm not talking about turning from their evil way in a repentance type of salvation here, but truly, those that are not saved are in an evil way. They're headed for hell. They're in a dangerous spot. And so they should be turning. They should be getting saved. If the preacher was true, the people would be saved. Churches are full of unsaved people. And you think, that, that is such a blanket statement, Alan. What how can you even back that up? You know, show me some kind of a proof or show me some kind of a statistic that says that churches are full of unsaved people. Well, you know, I will boldly say that, not just because I'm standing before you, you know, our church, a church of soul winners, but it's very evident to all of us who actually go out there and actually talk to people that go to other churches and actually talk to people out there in the world that churches are full of unsaved people. Doesn't matter the denomination, the, the, the gathering, the, what they call it, the name on the front, uh, how often they go, none of that matters. They're just all over the place churches that are littered with unsaved people. And, and I would say even in, in Baptist churches, I'm not gonna say they're overflowing with lost people, Okay, certainly there's many, many saved people in America today, but there are just scores of people in church this morning, scores of people in church that are that are flat out unsaved. And we know that because we go out and we talk to them. <clears throat> so here's the deal. A common testimony, some of you may, um, uh, may uh, agree with this or liken unto this, um, but a common testimony is that of one who called out to God to avoid hell, right? You heard this where, you know, maybe it was a, a, as a child or a young person, or maybe it was an adult. And, you know, flat out, they, you know, it was, it was when the soul winner, it was when the man of God, it was when the word of God was opened, and they saw the forecoming judgment is when they said, you know what, I don't want to go there. You know, it's hot enough in Kansas City today, 105 degrees. I don't need it to be any hotter, and I ain't going to hell for all eternity, right? They saw what the Bible says, and they said, you know what? I'm going to call out to God. I'm going to get saved. I'm scared to go to hell. I'm going to get saved, right? That's why we turn to Revelation 20:13, for example. You can turn there if you'd like. We'll read these passages. These are very, very familiar passages to us. These are our soul-winning passages. And there's a good reason why these are soul-winning passages. Revelation 20, 13 and, uh, through 15, we know it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Even as a saved person, that, that makes my hair stand up. You know, even knowing that that's not my destiny, I'm just reminded of how much that hurts the flesh, how much that hurt me when I was lost. And I'll tell you, that, that right there breaks my heart for people that aren't saved. You know, these types of verses, this is where this compassion comes from. In Revelation 21.7, we know it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8, But the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
Isn't it so funny that we can go out there today? Today, we'll go out there and we'll knock on people's doors and we'll talk to them about spiritual things in the Bible. And there's people that'll tell us that hell doesn't exist, that hell is not a real place. You know, uh, well, what do you mean when you talk about hell? What I'm talking about is a second death. All right, what I'm talking about is everlasting punishment, damnation, hellfire, brimstone, where smoke ascendeth up forever and ever. This is what I'm talking about. But you know what people say? Hell's not real. That's exactly what the devil wants people to believe, is that hell wasn't real. I think that there's too many Christians that don't believe that hell is real. Because if the Christians believe that hell was real, they'd be out there telling people not to go. In James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You know how, how sharp that is to a person who's trusting in good works to go to heaven? I mean, that's, that's twisting the knife. If they're listening with their ears, they get that. They know what that means. The fact is, we choose life. Mark 16, 16, we know, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It's not, it's not unclear. <laughs> We're not stretching anything to make this point here. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Choose life. Choose life. And when is it that we're ready to choose that life? It's when we're faced with the opposite end. It's when we're faced with the fact that we're headed to hell. That's when we really internalize the gospel message. We really let our heart be pricked by the God who wrote this book for us, and we choose Jesus Christ. And people that are going out there today with a light and fluffy door hanger, you know, they're going out there today with just a, a little invitation to church. I mean, there's no conviction there. They, they, are, they are the opposite of confrontational. I mean, they will not, they don't even want to knock on the door. I'm telling you, I've seen it firsthand. All they want to do is hang a door hanger. Or put out a mailer in the mail. That's all they want to do. They, so many today, they cannot have this conversation with folks. 1 John 5, 12, we know it says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Oh, but I go to this church. Oh, but I'm part of this religion. Oh, but I'm trusting in this. Hey, you don't have the Son? You're, you're out, man. That's it. You don't have life. <clears throat> So again, not to rip too much on false teachers, but it's clear that many churches, and more importantly, Christians, are not preaching God's word. We find perverted scriptures, and we find man's word. And that's oftentimes what we find, is go out there with some, with some uh, light message that is not of God. It's man's message, uh, with man's wisdom. <clears throat> and of course, and always be uh, skeptical when somebody says they've got a better way to do something, okay? If it doesn't line up with the Bible. If their way is better than the Bible, dead giveaway, turn, turn and burn right there. I mean, just get away from them. Uh, that, that's it. There's no better way than what Jesus Christ says, what the Bible says. So, uh, for an example, and I, and I just want to show you how, how sly some of this stuff comes in, how this lightness comes in, and how it's really... We can choose to be light as a Christian, as a church. We can choose to be light, or we can choose to be hard. And even when we go out here, I mean, door to door, our conversations vary, don't they, from, from door to door sometimes? I mean, if I'm talking to, a, to an 11-year-old girl, I'm not going to approach her or talk to her at all the same way as if I'm talking to a 30-year-old man, right. right? So, I mean, our, our conversation varies, and our heaviness is variable, Right? We've got a rheostat here where we can adjust this, but we shouldn't be light all the time. But uh, just to look even for an example here, of all that we learn in, in church, much of what we retain is in song, is it not? So in our hymnals, I'm not going to trash a hymn. It's a hymn that I've sung many, many times, and I'm sure I'm going to sing it again in the future. 368 in your hymnal is we've got a story to tell, and it's fine hymn. It says, um, we've got a story to tell. Verse 3 is pretty solid. Verse 4 is no lie. But it's just light. It starts out here and it says, We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn, turn their heart to the right. A story of truth and sweetness. A story of peace and light. 
Now, again, I, I don't wholly disagree with it. I'm not saying rip this page out of your hymnal. It's garbage here, okay? But we see here how this is only half of the message. This is, this is the good half. I mean, inevitably, when we go out and preach the gospel, we do get to the good half, okay? This is, we're talking about the hardness here because we're in Jeremiah, okay? It's very, very pointed. It's very cut and dry. But the, the, the gospel message is twofold. It, it's very fulfilling, Verse 2, it says, We have a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the Lord, a song that shall conquer evil and shatter the spear and sword. Okay. Yeah, you know, a song. Okay. I get it here. Verse 3, We have a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above has sent us his Son to save us and show us that God is love. Again, it's, it's not a lie. <laughs> it's what we preach. But it's not the whole message that we preach. Right? The, the, this hymn here is we've got a story to tell. It's the story of Jesus. A loving story. But there's more than he said. In, uh, in verse 4 it says, We have a Savior to show to the nations who the path of sorrow hath trod that all of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of God. Uh, again, I mean, salvation is available to all who will, who will have Jesus Christ, who will believe on Him. But this lightness here it's easy to infiltrate and be the whole message, to be the, the, the whole canon of songs that we sing, to be the whole word that we preach. And it's easy to take this lightness out into the streets, and that be the only thing that we talk about is the lightness. And what is especially, I don't want to say funny, but one thing that I noticed for sure about that hymn is you notice that there's verses tied to the hymns in many of them, and I assume that they're installed by the publisher. You know, I don't know that every single hymn or spiritual song was, you know, based off of a certain scripture or verse, but they're tied to them. And so what's funny about that one is on, on 368, it actually says Matthew 24, 14, which is fine. Great verse, great passage. Now, I don't usually go there when we're soul winning, but certainly could. Matthew 24, just to look at this, we know Jesus is warning of false prophets. Wars, death, hatred, tribulations. And verse 29 through 31, if we're to read those, 24, 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the, shun, shall, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and shall send angels with great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven and the other. And he goes on, talking about the parable of the fig tree. What I see here is that this message that we have to preach is all-encompassing. It's, it's a full message. And it's not only a message that just preaches a God of love that is coming in lightness, not light of God, but in lightness, you know, that is just so happy that everybody is getting saved and, and coming to heaven. The truth is we see here that there is a judgment coming that is heavy duty, hardcore. I mean, you read through, read through Jeremiah, just like we read through in Genesis and Exodus, different things. Revelation smokes them. I mean, what's coming in Revelation? It, over, it overshadows all that stuff there. <clears throat> so we have a story to tell to the nations. Verse 7 says nations. Verse 14 says we must preach it, and then the end comes. To reference verse 14 with no context, it's kind of silly, and, um, you know, it's not what this sermon's about, and that's not at all what the hymnal's trying to do, is just reference one random verse, you know, just paraphrase it. But... You know, what's even so funny about that is the dispensational preachers and others will say that that's not even for us. So it's a funny thing. But And uh, I'm sure that verse wasn't the inspiration for the hymn. I don't know, maybe it was. Maybe it was Jeremiah 1.5. Uh, he was a prophet unto the nations, uh, after all. But either way, I personally sung this hymn at countless missions conferences. So what are our missionaries doing? I wouldn't support a missionary that's light. 
you know, that, that's a light preacher. Would you? I mean, I, I hope we wouldn't. You know, a, a, a missionary that's out there not preaching the gospel, not preaching the truth, not getting people saved, not growing churches. I mean, well, what else is a missionary supposed to be doing? You can go out there and dig ditches or, or dig wells or, you know, whatever, I guess, but, but I, I'm not going to support a missionary that's not, you know, that's light on the gospel, that's light on Jesus Christ, that's light on sin. No way. <clears throat> How about singing a light song? We've got to be careful. You know what? Our hymnal's full of great, great songs. These, these songs in our hymnal, they teach us about God. They teach us about his love. They teach us who he is. I mean, these songs that are in the hymnal, I sing all week. You know, there are songs that have, uh, they speak to our hearts. They resonate within us. We sing them in our families, in our cars. Um, they're not all heavy-duty, rip-your-face-off hymns. I get that. But we can choose if we're going to be hard. Sometimes we can choose if we're going to be soft. And there's many that choose the soft way all the time. <clears throat> and I hope that we wouldn't do that, but uh, so many Christians are, um, are doing just that. And then, you know, not to really go off on a, on a rant on, on music, but this hymn is sung in many Baptist churches, and the music in the worldly churches is just downright wicked. I mean, it, it, they have thrown the hymns out the, out the window. Um, they've gone totally contemporary, so many of them. Um, and I couldn't believe it. I even got in uh, somebody's car the other day that had it on uh, K-Love or one of the stations, one of the contemporary stations, and the sound system in the car was really good. I don't remember what kind of car it was, but their sound system was way better than my sound system in my car. And I couldn't believe, like, the bass that was in the, in the Christian song. And the Christian songs already are so uh, repetitive. They're, like, very re repetitive and almost like a chant. And then when I heard it in that car with like the heavy bass kicking, and I mean, I, I played the drums, you know, I've listened to bassy songs, I had subwoofers in my cars, but um, not as a Christian, I don't have any of that stuff. Um, but uh, I play the drums, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, but just hearing the repetitive beats, bass drum, and the chanting, and the repetitiveness of the music, it's like, my goodness, you know, this Christian music is really almost dangerous. Seems like it's really trying to, like, put me in a trance or something there. So, it's really dangerous, and, and so we've got to be careful with our hymns and, and what we listen to, but um, not, not shying away from the hard way. Not shying away from the, the hymns that really speak a hard truth. Uh, numerous times we've been instructed on a better way to be less confrontational at the door, and I would say nuts to that. No, I, I'm not listening to that. We're not listening to anything like that. And, and what's funny, and I mentioned it already, but these, these people are okay with church invitation, but it's when we start pushing on them. That's when they really have a problem. And you, I know you all have experienced that. And you know what? Honestly, um, for me, that's, that's really um, when I see a seasoned soul winner, a person that really knows their Bible, they know the scriptures. It's not when they can like go toe-to-toe -to -toe and contend with somebody, but it's when they can ask them the questions and get into the conversation and really start having that spiritual conversation. You know, that, that's when a soul winner is really effective, you know, when they're, when they're relying on God and God's working in their heart and he's drawing them to him and they're, they're going over the scriptures and they're applying them to themselves. I mean, that's a beautiful thing to watch, you know, to be a silent partner and see somebody and I know you've seen it, but you, you stand there and you watch somebody's heart turn to the right. I mean, you can see it. You see it in their face. Um, it's just a beautiful thing. And, and, a, and a seasoned soul winner is really good at that. But if somebody just shies away from the hard conversation every single time, you'll never get to that point, ever. You'll never get to it. So what do we need to preach? We need to preach a balanced message, a complete message. Not all one food group, uh, not just dessert, not just appetizer, not just meat. Um, and it's the same for the believer, whether it's in our weekly uh, sermon, we need to have a balanced diet, um, whether it's in our uh, weekly reading, we have a balanced diet, and when we go out preaching, it's uh, with balance. Uh, notice uh, what Jeremiah was preaching and why, and line that up, we'll line it up with the New Testament in just a minute, but I don't want you to think that God has changed, okay? God hasn't changed from the Old Testament. The things that he said back then are still uh, applicable today, and two things that we see are we see plain and faithful reproofs. You know what? There's a lot of people that we talk to that know better. You know, there's a lot of people that we talk to that are saved, um, and we can talk to them as a, as, a, as a child of God, as a, as a brother or a sister. You know, we can talk to them and say, you know what? This is what the Bible says. You know, this is where you need to be. This is what you need to be doing. You know, get out of that other church that's not preaching the gospel. Get out of that other church that's not doing the work. Um, you know, you need to be 
uh, walking with the Lord. And then we find also the awful warnings. And, you know, that applies to the believer, but also to the unbeliever, too. Uh, you know, a prophet to the nations. You know, we preach to, to everybody, and we preach those awful warnings. So uh, some of these reproofs, pastors need to preach on sin. And uh, not just pet peeves or preferences, but we need to preach the Scripture. And every preacher needs to be preaching on sin and keeping it sinful. Now, not every week, not every sin. But you know what? When things start creeping in, the pastor knows. All right, well, the things that are going on in your lives, whether you like to uh, believe it or not, the pastor knows what's going on in our lives. Now, not everything, but the pastors know. They know what's going on. And when pastors are overlooking the things that are going on in the church and the things that the congregation is dealing with, it's very unfair. It's not fitting at all. And, uh, and, and God is very um, unhappy with that, and I know that from what we read there in Jeremiah. Uh, and then the pet peeves and the preferences, it's not, it's not for the pulpit to preach on those pet peeves and, and things. You know, I, I've seen that before where, you know, preachers will uh, pick on things or uh, make up an issue just to have something to preach on. And that's not fair. The scripture is so full of uh, uh, the truth of God that there's plenty to preach. You don't need to make things up or, uh, or preach on a pet peeve. Uh, but they need to be preaching and preaching the scriptures. I like in Jeremiah 1.6. If you go back to Jeremiah 1.6, and, and here again, this is great for the soul winner. Jeremiah 1.6, you know, young people pay attention to this. <clears throat> Ones who are still not... Um, you know, confident speakers as, as soul winners. Pay attention to this. In Jeremiah 1 6, what's he say? He says, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a child. Verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. I'm telling you what, we go out door to door, soul winning with our Bible in our hand. And there's a good reason why we have our Bible in our hand, because those are the words that we ought to be speaking. That's what we've been commanded to go and to, and to preach. And I'll tell you, it's very humbling and it's very intimidating, I think, for new soul winners to go out with a Bible in your hand. Isn't it funny? Like, because you're afraid that you're going to have to actually open that thing up and use it. But that's the whole idea. That's exactly what we're going to do is try to open that thing up and use it a little bit. And uh, I remember that, you know, you start going out with the Bible. And then for me, it was like, you know what, if I'm going to be carrying this thing around, I better know what it says. You know, and that is not only for soul winning. If you're carrying your Bible with you to work, if you're carrying your Bible with you in your car, if you're carrying your Bible with you wherever you are, you better know what that thing says. And so it's just very uh, humbling and encouraging for us to do that. But what is it that we're out here speaking? We're not speaking uh, our own things. We're not out here making something up as we go. Um, we're, we're saying what God has for us and for others, the message that he has. We have the word of God. Many today are living lives and even in correction by God and need to know the consequences. The unsaved are in danger of hell fire. The unchurched are hardly doing anything and most times nothing for God. They're not bearing any fruit at all. So there are warnings of an impending judgment still yet to come. And Jeremiah wasn't the first to warn the people or the nations either. And we know that. He, he wasn't the first. He was in a lineage of prophets trying to turn God's man, uh, God's men. Uh, we see in Genesis 3, I mean, the Garden of Eden and the fall of man. Was there not instruction there and, and, uh, and a ramification? Uh, Genesis 6, 7, Noah and the flood. Um, Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Uh, Genesis 12, God telling Abraham of blessings and cursings to followers. Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. Exodus, uh, chapter 5 through chapter 10, the Exodus plagues. God is not to be taken lightly. I mean, the God of the Old Testament is not a different God than we serve today. It's the same God. <clears throat> and so we read about those things like they're fairy tale. And, you know, there's something, uh, something else, you know, that I've, um, I kind of avoid doing. It's calling the passages out of the Bible uh, Bible stories. It's just something, you know, I have no problem if anybody ever calls a Bible story a Bible story. That's what they are. I mean, that hymn right there, we have a story to tell to the nations. It's the story of Jesus Christ, and that's not wrong. But it's, when I hear a Bible story, I liken it unto something that's not matter of fact. You know, it's, this is a, a passage of scripture, right? This is a, a testament out of the Bible. This is something that the word of God stands sure on uh, and so whether it's, you know, any of these or many, many other historical matters of fact from the Bible, 
uh, people ought to know them, and they ought to be able to preach them. And just to say, it says in the New Testament, you know, it refers back to, to these types of events and these events literally. Um, you know, remember Sodom and these types of things, you know. So it is there for a reason, and uh, God is not to be taken lightly. And what else is funny is that these uh, events in history sound a lot like things that we read about in Revelation. The seals, the trumps, the vials, all this stuff is yet to come. And people aren't reading Revelation. I mean, churches, uh, Christians in churches, they don't know what Revelation says. They don't know what's coming up in Revelation. They're, uh, they're trusting their pastors and their preachers to tell them what they need to know, but the pastors and the preachers don't know what Revelation says. Uh, they'll tell you flat out, well, it's really, it's really complicated. It's really too hard. I mean, you know, we're not going to, you know, really dig down deep into Revelation. You know, we're just going to stay in the Gospels. Or we'll stay over here, you know. That's, that's crazy. Because if we knew what was in Revelation, then we would know what's to come. And there is still, still things to come. Again, doesn't Matthew 24, because we were there already, uh, talking about preach uh, for a witness to all the nations. Uh, verse 15 say, let him understand the things that are coming. Let him understand. Christians today need to understand the Bible. They need to understand the prophecy. They need to understand the promise. And we need to understand the importance. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. We know that. He was broken hearted. I mean, imagine, you know, Nobody listening to you, you know, I mean, just reviling, and not only him. I mean, how many times in the Bible do we see God's man really being reviled, um, but the weeping prophet? I like in uh, Romans 10 when Paul said, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I imagine him just broken hearted about this, you know, and, and there's other passages like that as well. Uh, but we can line this up with what's going on today. What do we see out here today? In Jeremiah 1 and 16, Jeremiah 1 and 16, it says, I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickednesses, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worshipped the works of their own hands. Okay, this world is riddled with idolatry out there today. I mean flat out riddled with idolatry. And people always want to say, oh, I know uh, the joke in the youth departments, you know, is always the cell phones or the idols, you know, and these types of things. Yeah, it is so much bigger than the cell phones that we have or the, the things in our possession. Idolatry is everywhere. In Jeremiah 2.13, what's it say? My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. You see here, this idolatry, uh, they are, um, they are uh, not only doing away with the truth of God, they're not only rejecting the God of the Bible, but they say, we've done it better. We've got a better way. Well, I'm going to tell you, the cisterns that they're building, it says right here, they're broken cisterns, they can't hold a candle to living water. Right? A bro you know what a cistern is. It's a box in the ground that holds water because you don't have public water supply. A cistern with a crack in it is no good. A cistern that is poisoned is no good. You will kill your family. You'll have all kinds of problems. This is what man comes up with. This is like the best we can do. Right? God offers one thing, and we, the best we can do is a busted down hole in the ground and, and say that we're good with that. Jeremiah 10, 8, I like this, and the New Living Translation nails it, so I love it. Uh, 10, 8 says, but they're altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. You know what the uh, New Living Translation says? It says, uh, people who worship idols are stupid and foolish. I mean, flat out, that's what it says. So I like it. I say, hey, I might change my, my version. To, no, I would not never do that. But... You know, idolatry. Idolatry is everywhere. And it's saying, I can do it better. I can do it my own way. You know, my way is fine. Um, I love it in here, and I don't know, I can't remember now if I got the other passages there, but it talks about the stock, the wood and the stone that we come from. You know, you, you read that this week, and I just, it, it's laughable, except it's so true. You know, when you see what's going on out here in the world, when you hear what's going on out here in the news media and people bowing down to these uh, stocks, these wooden things, and these uh, saying we come from rocks, you know, it, it used to be a joke. Um, 
is this not what every workspace believer has done? Is said that we've got a better way. You know, that's what they say. They've got a better way. And Jeremiah 2.27, wow, well, here's, here's the verse that I was just talking about right here. Uh, I couldn't remember where exactly it was. In 2 and 27, <clears throat> it says, Saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth. They have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. What unfortunate is the day of their trouble would be too late for the people that are out there today. The people that are trusting in science falsely so-called, the people that are out there trusting in evolution, the people that are out there saying that hell doesn't exist and God doesn't exist and the Bible's written by man, by the time they're standing facing their trouble and they cry out to God, it's going to be too late. I even wonder oftentimes when we're standing at the door talking to them if it's not already too late. <clears throat> but I still preach. Amen. We still preach. <clears throat> Heathens, pagans, witches, evolutionists, all fall under idolatry. Catholic, Mormon, Muslim, the list goes on. And don't we know in 1 John 5, 22, he says, very simply, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Keep yourselves from idols. Children of God, keep yourselves from idols. Stay away from those things. Don't put our trust in those things. We trust the living God. How about in Jeremiah 7, 30? This is something else that's going on out here today that we see. People need to be preaching hard on this. Pastors need to be standing up. Christians need to be taking a stand. Jeremiah 7.30 says, For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my heart. God's command here comes in Leviticus 18, 21, Leviticus 21 through 5. In Jeremiah 19, if you look, 19, 5, it says, They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Do we think that this is not happening today? People are sacrificing their children left and right out here. Christians need to be standing up and taking a stand and calling out what is going on. Uh, there is uh, chemical castration taking place out here rampantly that people don't even know about. Uh, there, there are Christians that, are, that cannot be fruitful and multiply because of what's going on. There are clinics and offices and high places out here that are set for the destruction of children and infants. And, and it, is, it is so nasty what's going on out here. And God says, it's all ungodly. You're not doing that in my name. You know, it, you know I never, I never would have told you to do something like that, he says. In Jeremiah 4.4, 4, what do we find? Back in 4.4. 4. <clears throat> in 4.4, 4, the Bible reads, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn, that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Circumcision of the heart. How many churches today, how many pastors are preaching that you can do whatever you want, come as you are, and leave just the same, and, you know, God's not angry with you, and, uh, you know, God's not judging sin anymore, and all these types of things. It says right here very clearly, and in other places, New Testament, of course, be separate, right? Cut that stuff away in Jeremiah 9.26, another example here. In 9.26, Egypt and Judah and Edom are, and the children of Amnon and Moab and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness, for all have these nations, uh, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in their heart. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, chapter 7. In verse 15, we say, that doesn't apply today. We don't have to worry about circumcision today. Acts 7 and 51 says, He stick-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. You always resist the Holy Ghost. 
you know, we got to cut away the works of the flesh. We've got to cut away those evil works. They need to get saved. We need to not resist the Holy Ghost, reject God. In John 6, 44, <clears throat> 6, 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father, uh, except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. We see here, those who are rejecting the Holy Ghost will not be drawn by God. They'll not be saved. They will be rejectors through and through. They will ride that rejection of God and the Holy Ghost all the way to hell. All the way to hell, they'll reject God. We're not to do that. Circumcise the, the hearts and the ears. Listen. In uh, James 4.8, we know it says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. God was calling out the Jews for their evil doings in heart uh, and the desire to be like the world. And this needs preached today. It still needs preached. Um, you know, not every sermon is going to be ripping on some sin, you know, but it's, it's got to be preached. It's got to be uh, known uh, what stand God takes on these things. And we ought to leave church convicted every now and again. You know, I don't think I'm weird in the, fa in the fact that uh, I appreciate when, when the preacher steps on my toes, when the Bible steps on my toes. I appreciate when I'm reading the Bible and I'm convicted in my heart over something that I said last week or did this week or, you know, something that's going on. I appreciate that. It really, I mean, it confirms to me that I'm a child of God and he's working in my life and the Bible's real. You know, is it not? I mean, if, if, uh, if he's not chasing us, we're a bastard. We're not even saved if we can live in sin and not be convicted with it. So, you know, you're not going to be convicted out there in the world. We're convicted when we come into church, when we read our Bibles, when we're around our brothers and sisters, when we go out soul winning. It's those times. So we need to not be like the world. In Jeremiah 6.30, what do we find? Not going to make a, a huge issue about this, but it's in the Word of God. 6 and 30 of Jeremiah says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. There are other passages here as well, especially once we get into uh, 25, 30 through there, where it really talks about the rejection um, of the Jews, and forever on earth they will constantly be reviled, repulsive, rejected, again and again and again. But the point here is that there are those who the Lord has rejected. We know that. Um, reprobate doctrine, we call it. We don't have to go through it, but Revelation 22, 18 and 19, uh, the very last passages in the Scripture, says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So there are those who God rejects, who turns away, who he'll have nothing to do with. Romans 1, starting in 28, of course, we know these verses. says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. There are those who he gives over. He will let them do what they desire to do. Why is this important? It's because the things that kept men from turning in 560 B.C. still send men to hell today. It's the same issue. I mean, God is the same from before, and I'll tell you, men is the same from before. We're the same. It's the same issues. And what is it? It's pride. And, you know, pride is, is works-based to me. I mean, when, when I'm talking to somebody that's a works-based salvation, I just liken it unto pride. I mean, they're so proud of what they can do. They're proud that they can earn their way into heaven. Uh, they're proud that they'll be able to stand at that judgment seat and tell God all the great things they did. Well, you know what? That pride is going to lead them right to hell um, because what they believe is works-based. Um, and it's the same thing today as it was back then. Delusion. There is delusion today just like there was delusion back then. Um, ignorance. You know there's ignorance out there. How often do we stand and we preach to somebody at their door? We want to share with them what the Bible says and the gospel message. And they'll say, uh, no, I don't know for sure that I'm going to heaven. Well, can I take a few minutes and show you what the Bible says? Uh, we're cooking dinner. What? They just, they're ignoring the message. They're ignoring God. I mean, standing right there, and they, uh, and they won't, they won't, uh, 
They won't listen. That's heartbreaking, isn't it? And then hardness. There are those who are hard out there. The ones who practice and preach compassion are the ones described in Psalm 126, 5 through 6. Uh, great verses. We know them very well. I'll just go ahead and read them to you here. Psalm 126, 5 and 6, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Um, people say that the God of the Old Testament, the mean God, of course, is different than today. Hebrews 13, 8, we know, says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the fact is, they just haven't read the Bible because they talk about the God of the Old Testament being a mean God. Uh, as I said already, uh, Revelation just really, um, it's just over the top um, with what's going to happen. It's, you know, things that have never been done, never been seen, uh, can't even comprehend, quite honestly. As I read through, uh, whether it's the vials, the, the Trump, uh, um, whatever it is, uh, the seals, it just boggles my mind to think that those types of things can happen. I mean, the Exodus account, for example, I have a hard time believing the, the uh, Exodus account, the plagues uh, through Exodus. I mean, I don't doubt them. It, it's in the Bible, but I just can't imagine seeing those types of things. It's coming in Revelation. It's coming. People need to know about that. <clears throat> we do preach love. And we do preach grace, and we do preach mercy, and we're well-balanced. We're, we're compassionate, we're well-balanced in our sermons, um, in our uh, singing, and in our preaching out on the streets. And uh, in Jeremiah 13, 15, uh, 315, or rather Jeremiah 315, says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And this is, this is such a, a great promise. Um, from God, something that I see even today, is that though there are many churches out here with, with starving persons in them, I mean, I believe that there are saved people that are in churches today that are just starving. They're not getting fed, they're not getting nourished, they're not getting the Word of God preached to them. Of course, they can read it on their own, um, but they're starving in these churches. It's a great promise for me to see that God has said that I will give you uh, pastors that will uh, feed you, that will nourish you, um, he says, with knowledge and understanding. And this here, I mean, we're talking about Thursday night sermons, Wednesday night sermons, um, books of the Bible series, all that stuff that's not necessarily edgy or exciting. You know, all the stuff that doesn't necessarily make for great preaching, it is really great for knowledge, for understanding, for feeding us, for making us equipped to go out and to be able to knock on doors. You know, to be able to go out and know, know what our Bible says. That's why it's so important that we, that we stay involved in that stuff. You know, we, we've got to be here as often as we can to hear the Word of God preached whenever it is uh, for our benefit, it, and that's what feeds us. That's what nourishes us. And you know, uh, you, you've seen it before, and I, I'm not thinking of any one person in mind or anything, but there is definitely a difference between that Christian that comes to church as much as they can versus that person that just rarely ever comes to church. You know, they're, just, they're, they're not committed. They're not faithful. Um, there's just a huge difference there. And, uh, and the one that's, that's nourished and well-fed is the one that's in church as much as possible. And uh, I really like in Jeremiah 23, 29, he says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces? Those who are compassionate are out there preaching the fire and the hammer. We're out there taking the God of the fire and the hammer. I mean, think about a hammer. A hammer that breaks the stone into pieces. I've been doing some concrete work in my backyard, and I've been busting up some uh, old concrete. And the hammer that I'm using is not a small hammer. See, the hammer that Isaiah can use, to, to, that he can wield to break these stones, is much smaller than the hammer that I can use to break these stones. And so I have a big sledgehammer that we use for breaking those stones. And he can't swing that big hammer. I mean, he can pick it up. He's no wimp. I know, and my boy's not a wimp, right? But I can really break those stones a lot more effectively than he can with that big hammer. And guys, the God that we're out there preaching is the God of a big hammer that breaks these stones and a word of fire. I mean, a word that's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the uh, bones and the marrow. This is the God that we're preaching. So the, the, those are the ones who are practicing preaching compassion, those that are going out there with the hard speech when necessary, preaching God, and then compassion. Uh, compassion is recognizing the suffering of others and taking action to help. Listen, a church up the street that's recognizing the suffering of others 
because of their, their faggoty lifestyle or their queer uh, preference, uh, recognizing that um, uh, suffering that they're enduring and trying to be compassionate to them and welcoming them and coddling them, that's not compassion. That's not compassion at all. That's delusion. And that's letting them uh, die in their sin and go to hell and burn forever. So we recognize the suffering for others when we see those that are saved and those that need to get saved, uh, those that are lost and they need to get saved. And taking the action to help is sitting down with somebody and showing them what the Bible says. Just last week, being able to talk to a, a young man who, uh, who knew the verses in the Bible, who, who knew that the Bible was true, whose grandma had done a great job of planting those seeds and, and living the life, you know, that, that a Christian life is the right way to go. Um, but it wasn't until he was able to sit there and see the, the plan of salvation laid out, he was able to see what the scripture said and apply it to his own life, that he was able to get saved. You know, that is what it is, having compassion and taking action to help, right? People that are sitting in a church service that want to, you know, give a little bit of money or just say, you know, oh, we're in a compassionate church or uh, we're uh, open and affirming or, you know, whatever, whatever they want to sit there and say, they're not out preaching the gospel, you know. And you know what? I'm not saying that um, if you're not physically able to go preach the gospel that you're not right with God, okay? There's people that are able to preach to family members, they're able to preach to neighbors. They're able to preach to their mailman. They're able to preach in the grocery store. They are able to preach in all these different places. Um, but it's those ones who aren't sharing God, they're not sharing the gospel at all, who are not doing anybody any bit of good. Uh, Christians today uh, need to turn off their prosperity messages, and they need to walk out of their social club sanctuaries, and they need to read, and they under, need to understand the Bible, the book of Revelation, the book of Romans, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and every other message of God, and they need to cleanse their hands, and they need to draw nigh, and they need to have some compassion, and they need to go, and they need to tell somebody what lies ahead and how to be saved. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. God in heaven, we love you so much, and we thank you for your word. Not just the easy word or the light word, but the word that meant so much to us when we were able to call upon you. The word that, uh, that proves your existence, that shows your love and compassion, but honestly, God, the word that even convicts our hearts, that shows us that we're sinners, that we're uh, deserve not only do we deserve to go to hell but we work hard to get there god i'm thankful for your word the truth that's in your word and i'm thankful for this church the many many preachers that we have that are bold enough and sure enough um, and take the time to go and to preach your message that we can truly not only uh, have compassion on those who are not saved but be willing to go and to help them to get saved we love you and we thank you in jesus name amen i want to sing if you would in our hymnal a more appropriate